Good evening. Welcome to the College of Architecture and Planning. This is too loud, this is obnoxious. Um, Monday night lecture series, which is not on Monday night this week, to accommodate our speakers. So we're pleased to be here, even if we confuse things a little bit by changing it. So I think many of you know I'm Eric Kelly, I'm Dean of the College of Architecture and Planning. We're very pleased this evening to have our speaker, Peter Brink, who comes to us from Washington, D.C., where he is Vice President for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Before that, he spent 17 years in Galveston, Texas, working on historic preservation at the local level, as many of us do or have done or will do when we get our degrees. Um, he has degrees from Dartmouth and from Harvard Law School, and I'm uh, pleased to welcome Peter Brink from Muncie, Indiana. In these same years, the federal government was funding interstate highways 
that call for cutting wide swaths through existing cities, destroying or bisecting downtowns and residential neighborhoods alike. Bill Morrock, an attorney in New Orleans, saved the French Quarter from that fate, while St. Louis saw a 350-foot wide swath of cement and high-speed automobiles plow through its heart. In recent decades, we've seen the spread of new subdivisions, development of shopping malls, drawing residents, shoppers, and investment away from existing neighborhoods and downtowns. And now we see the mall starting to succumb to a new wave of superstores and category players. Today we face the difficult issue of how to protect the viability of existing towns, the livability of cities, the beauty of our countryside, our productive farmland, while benefiting from the creation of massive distribution systems of goods and services. Where is historic preservation in this changing world? I'd like to share with you some real life stories of how individuals and communities are using preservation to make a difference in the lives of people. As we look at these stories, I think each of you will see a bit of yourself in them. I think you'll see this in two ways. First, like the leaders in these stories, you as architects have the ability to visualize. Sometimes this will be looking at a clean piece of paper and starting from scratch, or possibly at a blank computer screen nowadays, and visualizing a totally new building. But to me, the more special use of your ability is to see the preservation opportunity in an existing situation, to look at a derelict, deteriorated structure, well, which everyone else has written off, and see the beauty of the original lines, the value of the massive beams and joists, and the structural soundness behind the scarred facade. You have the ability to move beyond the surface appearance and envision a rehabilitated structure full of shops or golf apartments and alive with people. In this regard, I'm struck by the insights of Stephen Covey, author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Covey notes that we create an accomplishment twice, once when we visualize it, and the second time when we actually do it. I think this is true. And it is especially true for preservationists in dealing with forsaken landmarks and neighborhoods. First, we are able to picture the restored, active building. And second, through hard work by ourselves and our allies, we make this picture a reality. Second, with your expertise, you will be in a key position to step forward to help save marvelous historic buildings, neighborhoods, and communities. Sometimes you will do this as an architect, working with a client. You will be in a position to advise the client competently on the potentials for reusing rather than demolishing a historic building. Both your appreciation for the building and your knowledge of how rehabilitation can be carried out will be valuable. And at other times, you will act as a community leader with the credibility of an architect. Here you will have the opportunity to help create the vision of what the historic building can be and to persuade and act to make that possible. It will often always be forces set against you. The immediate reaction of some government officials and businessmen is, that's not worth saving, tear it down. We're facing that problem right now in Omaha, Nebraska, where federal judges want a lovely 1907 building demolished because they feel it spoils their view. The preservationists in cases like this is often the pioneer, the risk taker, and even at times the rebel of the cause. It takes strong belief and courage to make the case and fight for preservation, to believe in the potential of the abandoned train station as the art center, the chance that an aluminum slipcover may be obscuring a handsome commercial facade, the old warehouse for loft apartments, to stand up in Omaha and fight for a historic building when the mayor, the newspaper, and local federal officials are all arrayed against you. To me, the excitement and directions of preservation can best be seen in real communities around the country. And if we can have slides, life's going to be good. Galveston, Texas, is a port city of 70,000 people on a barrier island off the Texas coast, 50 miles from Houston. It has a high level of poverty and struggles to find a strong economic base. For decades, day trippers have come to its beaches in the summer, 
The local joke was that they didn't change a t-shirt for a dollar bill. Galveston also was once, in the mid-1800s, the largest city in Texas, and is a magnificent collection of Victorian structures. In the 1950s and 60s, most people thought these hundreds of historic buildings, dilapidated as many were, should be torn down. Then an architect, Howard Barnstone, joined with others, like Michael Stewart Jr., to cry out that Galveston was an architectural treasure. Armstrong's book, The Galveston that Was, with photographs by Henri Cartier Bresson and Ezra Stoller, showed the deteriorated historic buildings and led, years later, to a sweeping preservation effort in Galveston. In 1973, Galveston preservationists recruited me to head the Galveston Historical Foundation. I found the change from being a Washington lawyer refreshing. I got to work with a whole range of people, from bar owners, homeowners, passion volunteers, bankers, city council members, persons controlling great wealth. I learned about being part of a community and sharing the lives of whole families, from the 80-year-old grandfather to the high school student. And I learned about sharing hard work, successes, and failures with a dynamic board of directors and eventually a skilled staff. Our initial priority was to save and revitalize the strand. 12 blocks of 19th century commercial buildings adjacent to the fort and Archie Reserve. We gathered a small band together and laid out a vision for all who would listen for the whole historic strand to be part of the mainstream of Galveston, full of shops, apartments, and offices, alive with Galvestonians and visitors. We used the network of the National Trust for Historic Preservation to learn from the experience of other successful communities. We created a real estate revolving fund with which we bought the underpriced buildings with deed restrictions on them to ensure preservation, and then worked to convince small developers and businessmen that the strand was going to succeed, and thus that they should invest substantial sums of money to restore the facades and develop the interiors for active uses. We created public events like Dickens on the Strand which eventually attracted 100,000 people a year. Our organization and private owners hired architects like Venturi and Ralph, Fort Powell Carson, and Taft Architects to create master plans, guide facade, facade restorations, design signs, and redevelop whole buildings. In brief, we carried out all aspects of a comprehensive commercial revitalization program. Our model was to do whatever it takes to save and revitalize the strain. Today, the Strand has attracted more than $100 million of private investment and is flourishing. In addition, our restoration of the 1877 bark Elissa tells Galveston's maritime history and has led to development for public use of the adjacent waterfront. As a result, the Strand area is the centerpiece of Galveston's transformation to a year-round visitor destination, and tourism is now the largest generator on the island. Revitalization has also spread to Galveston's historic residential neighborhoods, for example, in the 40-block East End Historic District. And Galveston, Galveston's political leadership has changed from purely good old boys to a much more representative city council, including strong community activists. As architects and preservationists in your communities, you will have opportunities to be part of efforts that can make a real difference as is the case in Galveston. A different example of preservations, including architects, making a difference is the adaptive use of the Chicago B Building, located in an inner city neighborhood on Chicago's south side. The Chicago B is a single building, a landmark that once housed the second largest weekly newspaper in the country, serving African Americans. For decades, the building, as an abandoned shell, symbolized the plight of the neighborhood. When the community and the city joined forces to renovate the building, they did more than save a historic landmark. They opened a new resource for the community and jump-started revitalization of the neighborhood. The Chicago B building was completed in 1931 by Anthony Overton, who was born into slavery and became one of the most important African-American businessmen of the early 20th century. A. Aerosmith designed the Art Deco facade. 
The building sits at the heart of Bronzeville and is one of the most significant structures of the Black Metropolis National Register District. While it stood at the vacant, scout scavengers removed everything of value on the interior and more than a dozen pieces of terracotta from the front facade. It was an abandoned wreck. Today, it serves as a library on the first floor and a literacy center on the second. The third floor is used for community meetings. Why is preservation and community use of the Chicago Bee Building important? As Richard Noble, president of the National Trust, stated in presenting a National Preservation Honor Award for the Bee, the resurrection of the Bee Building has invigorated community spirit and paved the way for future investment. An inspiring example of preservation as a tool of empowerment for our communities. In the words of a neighborhood leader, we will literally be using our roots to pull ourselves up. And in the words of a librarian of the Bee Building, now it's up and living a kind of new life. And it says to an individual that things can change. A person can look at this and say, look what can happen to me. These thoughts are echoed by T. Gunny Harpole, project architect. He says, I am a preservationist before being an architect. The B is not an architectural gem, yet the project is fulfilling. The reward comes in seeing people use it and care about it. It's been open about a year now, and there's no graffiti on the walls. I've worked on the rookery. Its architectural impact is broader, more significant. People come from all over the world to look at it. But working on the B, I can show people what their neighborhood has been, what it could be about. I can give something back to the community. It was like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. I enjoyed the process of mending back the fabric of the original building. Another example here in the Midwest is the phenomenal revitalization and adaptive use of Lower Town, right in the heart of St. Paul, Minnesota. People once considered Lower Town a no man's land of abandoned warehouses and railroad yards. Then in 1979, a visionary foundation, the McKnight Foundation in St. Paul, committed $10 million of seed capital for the establishment and operation of a nonprofit development corporation. Thanks to the work of Lower Town Development Corporation, the area now boasts more than $428 million invested in conversion of warehouses to active uses. Lower Town has now generated 1,500 housing units with 25% low to moderate income and created 4,300 new jobs. Wei Ying Lu, that's Wei Ying off to the left, uh, was born in China, and I will actually be going with him to China in about three weeks to look at preservation there. Uh, is president of the, of the Redevelopment Corporation is a planner by training, a skilled urban designer, and a preservationist by experience. He works side by side with architects, financiers, property owners, and tenants in this cutting edge area. They use both new and old to preserve and enhance the cultural fabric and to create a distinctive community. They test the latest ideas in solar energy and retrofitting to create a sustainable neighborhood. Galleries and artist offs support a thriving cultural community. As Wayne states, we have unique workspaces in renovated historic buildings, one of the most extensive fiber optic telecommunication infrastructures in the region, a satellite uplink, and a concentration of creative artists, designers, and engineers who understand the new medias and are finding ways to be part of them. Wayne speaks of creating a soft city or cyber village beyond the physical world of Lower Town. Underlying this momentum is the blend of historic buildings, creative arts, and high technology. Thus, one of Minnesota's most influential arts organization has recently moved its headquarters to Lower Town. The president states, it was an easy decision. We wanted to be in, a, in an historic building with high ceilings, close to a park, good technology opportunities, and we wanted to be near the concentration of arts and arts-related activity. This summer, Lower Town and the National Trust will convene preservation leaders from 10 cities who have had major successes in using preservation to revitalize cities. The purpose is to hold successful strategies 
and share them with leaders in cities across the country. These examples in Galveston, the Chicago Bee, and Lowertown show preservation as part of cutting edge strategies in our cities. Cities and inner city neighborhoods are a major frontier for preservationists, the next frontier, a place where you can use your knowledge and imagination and make a real difference. But the frontier is not just in cities. America's main streets and towns across the country are also exciting frontiers. Consider the town of Oak Mobile, Oklahoma, population 13,500. Tourism, previously unheard of in, in the town, is its newest industry. Two distinct cultures are juxtaposed in one small town. The Mustogi Creek Indian Nation established Oak Mobile in 1836 as their capital. In 1878, the Creek Council House was built, prompting white and blacks as well as Native American settlers to form a community around it. In 1907, with the first productive oil strike, the town flourished. But the oil bust in the 70s and 80s led to a massive exodus, and downtown was hit by arson and business closures. In 1986, the community was selected in the first round as a state Main Street community and immediately began to consider design. They had Ron France, the state Main Street architect, prepare fa facade drawings for two buildings and they were off and running. Ron also pointed out how important the abandoned Creek Council House was. This unfortunately I think was an after they couldn't find it before. And that it could be central to attracting visitors to the town. Town leaders took note as John Mabry of Citizens Bank states, the building had always been there, but it had gone unnoticed for so long. The activity surrounding its restoration stirred up a lot of interest in seeing the entire community revamped. The town raised more than $1 million restoring the concert house, and the Creek Nation now operates it as a museum of their history. The town has attracted $8.7 million of investment to the downtown including 200 rehab projects, that's the lot here, and it also drawing tourists in record numbers, drawn by the pride and the plight of the Creek Nation. The multi-story buildings, where the rich Oregon once started their stuff, and a living downtown that is part of that history. <clears throat> These examples, are for me close to the heart of what historic preservation is about. What then are the strategies that build upon what we have learned in revitalizing communities and will help communities to succeed in the future? Tonight I would like to highlight three important strategies. The first strategy is transportation policy. Our nation has come a long way from the days that massive highways smashed through the hearts of cities. A critical step in this progress is ICE T, the Intermodal Transportation Sur the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act. This legislation, passed in 1991, gave cities and other communities a greater voice in planning transportation systems. The goal is not only to help Americans move from one point to another as they want, but to do this in a way that is friendly to the communities they are passing through or living in. Communities across our country have a great stake in these advances. In addition, ICE-T provides community preservationists new opportunities in the Enhancements Program and the National Scenic Byway Program. From parkways and canals to historic railroad stations, scenic view sheds, rails to trails, a variety our partners are using ICT for preservation activities related to our national transportation system. In total, $3 billion is available over six years for such enhancement projects. Indiana is a superb example of the opportunities in ICT and the variety of partners needed for success. The United States government built the national road in the 1800s to link communities across six states now, ICT funding enables the National Trust, Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana, and the new Indiana National Road Association 
to work with communities across Indiana to interpret and protect the National Road heritage and to attract visitors. This work will result in a recorded management plan and nomination of the road as a National Scenic Byway. ICT projects in Main Street towns along the way complement the project, as does the work of the Indiana Division of Tourism. And a new six-state National Road Alliance will help coordinate activities from Cumberland, Maryland to Vandalia, Yellowwater. The National Road Project illustrates a beneficial partnership. On the one side, it is accomplishing historic preservation in more livable communities. On the other, it is effecting attractive and efficient transportation routes among America's special places. This is exactly what ICT enhancements and scenic highway programs are intended to do. Right now, Congress and the President are determining if ICT will continue. The National Trust and its partners have organized a national grassroots lobbying campaign to keep these important programs. I ask your help in this campaign and would be delighted to take your name and send you information as to how you can talk to your congressman to help in this effort. The second strategy is historic homes and neighborhoods. Traditional cities and main streets only work if close in residential neighborhoods are healthy. And this means families of all incomes who shop and work and play in their communities. Flight from deteriorating neighborhoods creates ghettos of poverty, adds to the financial woes of cities, erodes the viability of community, and explodes transportation and sprawl costs. The National Trust proposes a historic homeowners tax credit. This is an opportunity to save historic residential properties and for cities and towns to revitalize their historic neighborhoods and commercial areas, revive their tax bases, and reduce sprawl. The homeowner's credit will parallel the existing historic preservation tax credit for commercial historic properties. And we know that this existing credit for commercial properties has already attracted $17 billion of private investment in rehabbing historic structures since its inception. In brief, the proposed homeowner's tax, tax credit is an incentive for people to rehabilitate and live in historic houses. This will save thousands of National Register properties, but equally important, it will draw middle and upper middle income homeowners into inner city neighborhoods. It will make home ownership easier for moderate income families. It will provide a mix of people and incomes important to viable neighborhoods. The proposal is simple. It offers a credit on federal income tax equal to 20% of the rehab costs of National Register properties, provided the rehab is appropriately done and the homeowner lives in the house for at least five years. Republican and Democratic sponsors will introduce this bill next week. Its passage can make a critical difference in communities across the country. As exciting as these two opportunities for federal action are, in many ways, greater opportunities exist at the state level. As you know, Congress is shifting responsibilities to state governments in such critical areas as welfare and transportation. This is also true in preservation programs, including the National Park Service and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Yet traditionally, preservationists have not been well organized make their case to state legislatures and agencies. The most effective way to do this is by a strong statewide preservation organization. And yet as we look across America, we see only a handful of these organizations that have reached anything like their potential. To address this need, the National Trust joined with existing statewide organizations in 1993 to create the Statewide Initiative this program offers strategic planning, technical assistance, and challenge grants to support all volunteers statewide, statewide that have no paid staff and are solely the volunteer board of directors, and assist them to move to a new level of effectiveness, including hiring their first professional staff person. We are making strong progress. Today, 25 statewide have been selected competitively and are participating in the initiative 
and 12 of these are now hiring a professional staff person. The great model for effective state lines is, of course, right here in Indiana. Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana was founded in 1960. Thanks to the visionary support of Eli Lilly and the leadership of Reed Williamson, HLFI is the largest statewide preservation organization in the United States, with a strong board of directors, a staff of 40 at its headquarters, and five regional offices across Indiana. HLFI's award-winning Heritage Preservation Center anchors a now revitalized area along Indianapolis historic Central Canal. HLFI is the primary advocate in support of Indiana's State Historic Preservation Office and a close partner of Indiana's Main Street Program, Heritage Tourism Program, and Scenic Byway Program. HLFI has the courage to take on major challenges, like the West Baden Springs Hotel, once called the Eighth Wonder of the World. HLFI's annual list of endangered historic properties brought attention to its plight. The organization invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in stabilizing the structure, and now has purchased the historic hotel and seeks an appropriate developer. HL5 has also become a developer of a last resort for affordable housing and historic structures. It bought and rehabbed Christian Place, a complex of four severely dilapidated historic buildings in Indianapolis. HLFI transformed these eyesores into 29 apartment units, now fully occupied and accredited to 20 city. Might have the lights. I hope these strategies and community examples have furthered your interest in historic preservation. I will be invite you, if you are not already, to be members of the National Trust and HLFI. And I put some six-month free, free trust memberships uh, on a chair by the door. The reservation today will open doors for you into a wide range of professional and community opportunities. It will place you at the heart of what communities are about. And it will put you on the frontier of saving cities, towns, landmarks, and countryside. The National Trust welcomes your fresh energy, skills, and new ideas. We look forward to working with you.
you immediately have people trying to amend it in a way that makes it unworkable. So that was scuttled. What did come about is in the omnibus parks, parks bill that did pass, they designated about another 12 heritage areas. And right now we've been meeting with the Park Service to try and figure out if you don't have a new program, is there some way that the Park Service and others of us can be more effective in providing assistance to those designated areas? I guess, in concept, I think it is absolutely right. I think the trick is to go beyond the planning along that canal or that road and translate it into some real activity for revitalization, economic benefit, interpretation, and so on. Uh, I think that programs like Main Street are crucial to that happening. Because Main Street, as many of you know, is driven by the town. It has to be a town that has the commitment to want to restore and revitalize their historic downtown. And they normally compete to be selected. They have to raise the monies for a manager. They have to put together a board of the stakeholders from the city government, the private owners, the business people, and others. So that type of community action that can happen within the planning framework of a heritage area, I think is terrific. Uh, I would say the same approach can be taken through uh, the type of heritage tourism programs that we've initiated. And one of the marvelous things about both the heritage area and the tourism is that they don't deal with single communities. So whereas before communities were fighting, often through tourism, they can be made to see that the only way they're going to succeed in tourism is if they group together and they have a destination that's important enough to market and to get people to stop there. Uh, a wonderful example are the 20 ethnic communities between Chicago and Milwaukee. And you have Estonian and Hungarian and Polish. And they all have wonderful bits of those heritages in bakeries and restaurants and so on. They'll never make it individually. People aren't going to get off the highways to see one little town. But marketed together, they can become an experience that people will take the time to go and see. So I think the, the tourism approach is also critical. And then joining with the uh, environmentalists and the recreationists, I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, I guess our approach is twofold. It's one, to be ready with legislation if that's possible, and in the meantime, work with groups try and formulate some federal policies. But second, and probably more important in the long run, is to be providing programs like Main Street and Heritage Tourism that grassroots groups can use to make the concept of heritage area really work on the ground, because that's the only test. Other questions? Yes, yeah. Of the large stores, but 
with a proper scale and putting them close to the downtown, it can be a partnership rather than just wrecking the downtown. Um, and, and, I was, and I was disappointed that along with Tom Blay from close to where I was in Galveston, McIntosh uh, spoke in favor of zeroing out. What I liked about him was that he spoke about how wonderful Main Street was. And he said, even though we're not going to give you any money, you all better keep going Main Street. So I thought that was... Uh, but my sense of some uh, of the more conservative Republicans is that they hate bureaucracy and regulation, but if you can show them an incentive, uh, such as the Historic Preservation Tax Credit, they may well support it. It was actually President Nixon, his administration, that first proposed the existing Preservation Tax Credit and got it started, and then it was strengthened and spent weekend. Uh, so I think often a conservative, conservative approach likes this type of incentive. The harder part is you get into the whole question of uh, how are you going to offset the loss of income. And I think that the calculation by the Joint Committee was $170 million over five years. It's not a large amount of money in terms of the uh, trillions of dollars, billions of dollars that are being dealt with. But they're going to have to find an offset. And that's where they get pushed because they've got to then decide what priority it is. But I think in concept, it's the type of program that the public and I would hope McIntosh would like it that you all can convince him. And I would send him a bottle of champagne to get his support for that bill. And I hope Virginia and Ed will talk to him also. Yes. Madison, 
Madison, the, I'm actually going there in three weeks. So I better include it. Um, I haven't seen Madison, but I hear that the restoration there is absolutely phenomenal. You know, they were one of the original three Main Street towns in the late 1970s, and I hear it's just terrific, and I look forward to going there and talking. Uh, and I could come up with other examples if, if you all were getting it. From what I've heard here in Muncie, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't walk around the downtown a lot because I was looking at specific projects. I hear that it's sort of a, uh, a, a situation where there are three or four groups trying to help other downtown, and it sounds like people have really got to get together uh, and decide that they're going to make this thing work and all pull together to make that happen. And if you all were starting to do that and make the case, I would be glad to identify six, seven, eight examples of similar sized communities and the successes they've had. In fact, one of the things we're doing that I'm very happy with, I, as you can see, I love success stories, because I think there's nothing as good as being able to show somebody a community that's done it. Uh, and about two years ago, we started an honor awards program just for Main Street, and we get 150 or so nominations each year. And at the end of April, we'll publish a book on Main Street success stories. And it'll be like, I think close to 200 pages, 150 pages of all these success stories. And we can go right through that book and just check the ones that are similar to Muncie. And that would give you the ammunition, how long they did it, what their strategies were. And one of the marvelous things about Main Street is that they keep statistics systematically. So they can tell you for any Main Street program how many dollars are we invested today, how many net new jobs created, how many net new businesses, and how many rehab projects. So they can show you the economic return uh, in that downtown. So, in fact, Owen, I, I've got all your literature. Give me a card or something, and I will send that as a present so you can be a leader in this effort. Great. Other comments or uh, questions? Yeah. 